Hi, I'm Mike Goldsworthy, and this is Unbreak the Planet, where we talk about what's really, really messed up in the world right now and bring in guests to help us find the solutions that we need right now. Roger Hallam, uh, you are one of the co-founders of Extinction Rebellion, and that was in 2018 when you guys got together. Your background is as a businessman um, in agriculture, in, in farming, uh, but also you have pretty much completed, although not fully written up, um, a PhD thesis, a, a PhD course on uh, social change, political change, um, and how to enact that through mobilization. So to start with, g give me that overview on how it all came together in 2018, who your, who your co-founders are, um, how you met them. And I understand at the moment that Extinction Rebellion is not something that you're liable for because it's a it's a movement um, that you open the lid on and now it's for everyone to get involved. But how did that seed first come about? Yes, well, you're right. I'm not um, I'm not the voice of <laughs> Extinction Rebellion, <laughs> honest. Um, and uh, you know, I'm only speaking for myself in this capacity yep. on this interview, obviously. And um, the, the starting of Extinction Rebellion was very interesting. Um, as you just said, I was doing research at King's College on how campaigns can be successful. And it was all based upon design principles and empirical research in the sense that I spent most of my time with campaigns in London, working out what they wanted to do, how they could design themselves to win. That's what I'm in to. So for instance, I helped set up the, the first successful rent strike in London right. by doing canvassing. Um, I helped uh, a small scale union get wage increases for casualized workers through doing direct action right, uh, and such like. So around three years ago, I, I, I was reasonably well known, as you might say, in a few circles, and a bunch of climate activists came to me and we had this workshop when they were going, well, you know, climate change, it's massive. How are we going to overcome it? And the first thing I said to them is, is the number one question if you want to win a campaign is, what are you dealing with? You know, if there's some litter out on the street outside this building, you don't need to blockade London, right? You just put a leaflet out, have a litter collecting session, maybe talk to your local councillor. Job done, right? Yeah. You know, if you're trying to get better wages for casualized workers in London, then yeah, you may need to occupy one or two offices. That will get the job done. Going to talk to the boss won't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, if you're trying to sort out the climate crisis, then that's massive. It's not massive for, you know, that's not a political statement. It's analytical. I'm a designer. I'm not that interested in the ins and outs and the rights and wrongs of things. I'm more interested, as a scholar anyway, in how you can design something. And what I said to them is, okay, so the climate crisis, it's universal, undeniably universal. It's affecting everyone in the world. It's existential, which is this nice, polite word for billions of people are going to die if it's not sorted out. And it's exponential. It's getting worse. The rate at which it's getting worse is increasing because of the feedback mechanisms. And of course, it's a physical crisis. Mm. So I said, the only way you're going to be able to deal with it is through systemic change. And again, systemic change is a nice, polite word for social disruption leading to, you know, a major change in political structures. Yep. And you can use a few other words there if you like. So what you're basically saying is um, your actions in order to get the change need to be proportionate to the threat that you're seeing. So if it's just about litter, then you need to apply just enough pressure to make sure that you get the change. Yeah. If you're talking about something that's more challenging, then you need to up it still. But if you're talking about the whole world working on a system that is wrong and damaging and going to actually cause vast, vast damage, then the action that you need to take really needs to be ramped up dramatically in order to make change at that level. Absolutely. And obviously, that's a bit of a no brainer, isn't it? It's like strategy 101. Like, 
design what you're going to do in order to win. Mm. <laughs> right? So you're coming you're very much going, at it. You're not from... just going through the motions. If people want to go through the motions, which is what I yep. call protest, protest is when you make a statement you don't like something. That's not winning a campaign. Winning yep. a campaign is about power. It's yep. about a, the application of power against your opponent's power. And, you know, that's a strategic point. Obviously, we can talk about the morality of it as well, which is a parallel argument, which is if something's really bad, then you're justified in doing bad things in order to put it right. Mm -hmm. And that's a basis of English common law, just, you know, as a little aside. You know, the right of necessity says in the, you know, like in the... Um, great fire of london mm. people knock down houses in the city without asking the owners right that's yeah, illegal just to make the fire breaks right exactly yeah. it was justified it was a right of necessity you're either going to knock the house down or you're going to have the whole of london burned down you've got to create this like, yep so you so you do this now and then you you compensate later or whatever yeah. but everyone understands that you've got yes. to get on and, that's, and it's yeah. a principle right yeah it's a principle that everyone accepts and of course in any particular context you have to analyze whether that's justifiable or not. Yep. And, you know, sometimes so it's not, sometimes What I find most fascinating about this is I think there's probably a lot of people that think Extinction Rebellion just grows out of the loony left and it's people just, you know, panicking about stuff so they're prepared to do anything. Mm. But it's not. It actually comes from design principles up front from a workshop of this is the scale of the problem, so this is the extremity of measures needed according to what we know about campaigning so it's it's designed to be different from other kinds of campaigning because it's at a different level in scale from from most other campaigns that you will see around which are dealing with smaller issues well it, it came out of an intellectual project in the truth be known and that intellectual project had one question which is why over the last 30 years has the environmental movement catastrophically failed to stop yep. the increase in carbon emissions so the bottom line there's always a bottom line right mm. the bottom line is carbon emissions have increased by 60 percent mm -hmm. since 1990 when the world was told categorically by scientists that we're heading for the collapse of civilization or whatever other word you want to use if we don't cut carbon emissions so as i've said many times you know i'm on record saying this this isn't i'm not making a bitchy point right i'm not saying that the people in the environmental movement, which includes me, uh, are bad people. Like people have put their lives into trying to stop this and they've worked very hard. But putting your life into something and working really hard is no guarantor in itself of success. Mm. Success is really the product of intellectual analysis, right? Yep. So what this what Extinction Rebellion wasn't like Occupy, right? Occupy was great and all the rest of it, but Occupy came out of a a surge of enthusiasm. It wasn't pre-designed. Extinction Rebellion came out of a pre-designed process where people yep. sat down. So that's the distinction and, that I was And that's why yeah, it was successful. Highlighting. Yep. Is, you know, there was a various different elements in it. So then this also answers um, another question because I've seen you interviewed by Nigel Farage and, and, and Andrew Neil, and uh, they both kind of take this line of, um, I support your cause. I, I, I believe in, in, in um, the importance of sorting out the environment and, in, and problems with it. However, can't you be more reasonable? Um, can't you talk about planting trees? Can't you put this within the framework of what's more practicable? You know, when you say you've got to get rid of all cars and, and so forth and so on, can't you just be nicer and work with us? But what you're saying is that for 30 years, you've had Mr. Nice, Mr. Nice, please, please think about this, think about that. It really is a threat. And people have still stayed in their comfortable lives and said, oh, that could cost a bit and that could cost a bit. And they haven't done anything. So now it's a switch up mode to we really need to shift the Overton window here. This is where we are. This is where we should be. Stop the cars, stop the flights. That's where we really should be. Um, and part of it is is to... Um, piss them off, get in their grill, shock the system, so that they have to talk to you um, about this, so that they have to engage, so that um, it feels very different from the last 30 years of being. Yeah, I think what, what right-wing commentators make the mistake of doing 
is confusing morality with uh, effectiveness. They're, those are two different analyses. Like, you might not like people sitting mm. in the road. That's fair enough. But that's a separate question from whether it's effective or not. Mm. You know, lots of people don't like workers going on strike and they think it's wrong, which may or may not be the correct. But what you can't deny is that labor strike is effective, you know, as a general principle, which is why it's been used over and over again. Over I would say it is the same with um, some of the characters in the pro Brexit campaign. Uh, morality sort of went out of the window with regard to truth, but you can't argue that Dominic Cummings was effective. Yeah. Um, in he he had a target. He knew talking about the NHS, making threats about Turkey and, and Syria was going to be like part of it. So and went the, and got what they want. The, you know, he appropriated what you might call left-wing traditional methodologies. Mm -hmm. And in the radical tradition, not least in this country, there's example after example after example of people taking direct action, which is unpopular at the time, but was undoubtedly effective in changing social attitudes. I mean, the classic example is the suffragettes, for instance. Yep. You know, when the woman went on to the race course, right, in front of the king's horse, that, that was arguably a terrible thing to do, but no one can doubt that that put the issue of women's right to vote right at the centre of the national conversation. Yes. And that's basically what I study, is how people can take appropriate action, obviously, in order to get a reality, a moral reality, in front of, of, the, of the population. And that's and, a tricky balance, because at the extreme end of that, there is, of course, terrorism. Yeah. Like, you, you, can, you can certainly get yourself in the news by committing acts of terrorism, for a political cause, um, and but is terrorism effective? No. Why not? <laughs> well, in in the social scientific literature, there's there's numerous studies which mm -hmm. compare nonviolent conflict with violent conflict, and according to one study, fifty two percent of nonviolent eruptions are successful. Twenty five percent of violent eruptions are successful. So it's not like violent eruptions are never successful, you know, there's Russian Revolution, for instance. But yeah. what's interesting is, of those 25% of successful violent eruptions, five years down the line, those countries are either in civil war or some sort of authoritarian, anti-democratic situation. Right. So only one in 20 actually gets to something progressive. In other words, so with the violence, they get what they want in the short term, but then it, it's it like you're winning, it falls you win in on the war, like, like in Iraq, yeah. you win the war, but you lose the peace. That's the problem with violence. You can win. Everyone knows you can win with violence, but it's extremely difficult because it creates a macho, vile, aggressive culture mm -hmm. where people, when they disagree with each other, they tend to turn to violence. Right. Now, what Gandhi and Martin Luther King were doing, which is the tradition that I study and what the tradition which Extinction Rebellion is in, and Insulate Britain and all the rest of these things, is saying there's this sweet spot, right? We know that, you know, placid reformism doesn't work when you're dealing with entrenched power. Yes. And that's the criteria, by the way, right? You know, if, as I said, if you're looking at litter, that's not entrenched power, that's just laziness. Yes. You don't need to do anything. You just need to raise consciousness. But the fundamental error of the left and progressives at the present moment is this delusion that you can change climate change, you know, the climate change crisis through consciousness raising. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at what Martin Luther King did and Gandhi did, in fact, if you see, if people have seen the film Selma, there's this scene where Martin Luther King goes into Selma and there's these people who have been consciousness raising, you know, they're doing leafleting, they're doing meetings, people are concerned about racism, they want, you know, rights, fantastic. And Martin Luther King goes, so has it worked? And they go, well, no. And then Martin Luther King goes, what we do is disruption. We're coming into Selma in three months. In three months, we're going to change it around. Now, there's no absolute guarantee, of course. You know, this is the real world. But there's a substantial probability that if you do organized discipline, mass civil disobedience, you get rapid results in order to actually fundamentally change the structures of power in society. And there's nothing else in, on my understanding, from my study, 
that even approaches the effectiveness of this methodology. And that's why Extinction Rebellion was so successful in, in 2019, because it had mass civil disobedience. So then what did, in your view, Extinction Rebellion achieve so far? Well, if you remember, like, you know, when we, when we were looking at doing mass civil disobedience at the beginning of 2019, lots of people said, no one's interested. No one's interested in the climate. Everyone, the whole of the news agenda was dominated by Brexit, if you remember. Oh, yeah, and I remember because, yes, I mean, <laughs> it was I was, like, I was campaigning it was like against how, Brexit. How are you going to capture, capture yeah, yeah, the yeah. attention? And what we said was, we can't afford not to take the risk. Mm -hmm. In other words, the, you know, one of the fundamental things people have to understand about the climate crisis is it's not like slavery. It's not like Hitler. It's not like civil rights. It's not like if you don't sort it out, this year, it's obscene and outrageous, but you've always got next year. Mm -hmm. That's not the situation. Sir David King, you know, the know. former yes. chief scientific advisor, is on record as saying, we have to move rapidly. What we do, I believe, in the next three to four years will determine the future of humanity. Mm -hmm. Now, as an analyst, that's a critical data point because what it's saying is, is it's going to be over soon because the Arctic's going to melt, the Amazon's going to yeah, be cut we've, down. We've got the limited time window. You've okay. got the limited time limit. So, yeah. so, so then given that it's that urgent and the pressure's really on, what has Extinction Rebellion achieved so far? Like in, well, in, as, I was, in as I was just about to say, right. in 2019, if you remember, like nothing had happened for 30 years, which was significant in order to shift opinion. And when 10,000 people went to London in April 2019, mm -hmm. 1,200 people were arrested. That's the most people that have been arrested for the last 100 years. It was a major political event. Mm -hmm. You know, we spoke and to all what, the main politicians. what change did it cause? I think it did two things. It made the government, it made the parliament say that there's a climate and ecological emergency. That's number one. Mm -hmm. And number two is it changed the national conversation, mm -hmm. which shouldn't be, you know, belittled because... People need to understand there's a climate emergency. Before April 2019, most people hadn't even heard of the phrase, right? Afterwards, yep. I think there was a poll, 67% of the British public accepted it was a climate emergency. Now, that's not so, so that, sufficient, obviously, yep. right? No one's pretending we've won the war, but it was a significant initial step. And, of course, the big challenge now is as so in the 1960s it's consciousness awareness but more aggressive consciousness awareness are you it, actually monitoring it in polling i mean do you have people that you work with or a team that that do regular polling on how aware people are or or how urgent they think it is i mean this comes to another question that that, that i have and and that is um who is most responsive to your messaging who who is most activated who is um charged up by what you're doing what what parts of society and who is most resistant to uh your your messaging and your cause well there's no surprise as the rich and powerful are most resistant mm. <laughs> you know that's that's as and how old do you, as the how do you see that manifest itself well when when i came to london five years ago you know i was a farmer for 20 years and i never actually saw anyone particularly you know farmer's life is quite hard mm. so it was a little bit like i'd been in exile and i did have this slightly naive liberal idea that you'd go and talk to the great and good you'd give them the facts you know like sir david king you've got three to four years yep. this is an absolute crisis of civilization and i had this naive idea that all go well roger that's terrible you know let's let's go on a, a national speaking tour let's you know, yeah, let's organize mass civil it. disobedience. Yeah, let's yeah. mobilize the whole population. Let's show some leadership. You know, let's do what Martin Luther King did. Let's do what Churchill did. You know, these great figures of the 20th century. And what's happened was just a deafening silence. Yeah. I, I actually found... And uh, I, I actually found that quite traumatizing. Yeah. But, you know, because ordinary people get it. I, I mean, I've done over 100 talks around the UK. And the first 20 minutes is this is what's happening with the climate. You know, you're being lied to systematically by the elites. We're looking at billions of people that are going to starve to death if it's not sorted out. And we've got three to four years, you know, give or take. 
-hmm. It's an absolute crisis. And you have, you know, grandmothers in tears in 20 minutes. You have, I was, I was doing a talk in, in um, Hammersmith, mm -hmm. right? There's a mm -hmm. gentleman there, got white hair, nice, nice, nicely clothed, you know, good middle class Hampstead sort of guy. Yeah. And there's, his eyes are well, welling up. Yeah. Because what he's realizing is everything he believes is now in question because he's spent his whole life quite rightly thinking I'm a liberal person, I'm a liberal Londoner, you know, I want to see society continue, I want my kids to have a prosperous time, I want a, a civilized London life. And what he's looking at is into an abyss. Yeah. And that's that's the that's what's going on all around and, society. And you don't get that response from politicians. No. See, this this is interesting because it, it relates to something that um I found because before I set up Scientists for EU, I was part of Scientists uh, for Labour and in the science community as a whole, we'd been lobbying sort of government, ministers and MPs for, for more funding into science because science solves all these problems coming up. We're really underfunding it. And for um, a, a decade or more, like our science funding was stagnant and we kept lobbying politicians about it and they didn't care. So when the um, Brexit referendum came along, I said, right, well, um, it doesn't work just lobbying um, MPs. Now we've got the opportunity that we've got a referendum on. We can, we can campaign for the science community directly to the public about the importance of working with the rest of Europe on collaborative projects, um, how important science is to society going forward, all of that. And by actually setting up more of the science groups campaigning on this, writing more articles on this, then, and when we came around to 2017, all the three major parties were promising a doubling of science because Brexit had brought the issue of science to the fore. But politicians, because this came out of my, my theory, that politicians do not respond to um, moral pressure um, or intellectual pressure. They respond to what they're seeing in the press and what they're seeing from their constituents. And when there's conversation happening there, then they want to get on top of that conversation and lead it and do something about it. But if it's just directly to them, they don't feel confident about taking lead and, and breaking that issue through to the public. They, they have to see it all going on around them and then try and get on top of it. So it's yeah, really yeah. interesting. I, you I, take I, it straight I, to politicians, I, I, you get nothing. You take it to the public, the pressure politicians. We need to be a bit more sophisticated in our analysis, sure. right? First of all, Politicians do listen sometimes to some things. What do they listen to? They listen to minor issues which they can act upon without frustrating any power structures. Yes. So, for instance, to have a surgery, you know, there's an obvious injustice. They'll take that up because there's no costs involved yeah, in, it's, in doing it's, that. It's the easy so that's win. the first yes. level. The second level is what you might call conventional politics. In conventional politics, you know, you want some legislation you get various civil society bodies on board, you get letters to the MPs. And if it's, a, if it's a, an issue which is, again, doesn't upset the basic power structures of society, you, you've got a good chance. I mean, democracy works within limits. Let's not knock it, right? Yep. It's better than a dictatorship. But when you, there's, a third, there's a third category of political change, and that's the political change which fundamentally challenges entrenched power structures, right? And I'm being sociological here. I'm not making a moral an analysis of it about, about it. I'm simply saying, yeah, as an analyst... A, a left-wing or a right-wing thing, this the, is yeah, looking at that, where you get In that situation, yeah. you're not going to change those entrenched power structures without organised civil disobedience. Hmm. And there's a long tradition in Western democracy of this happening, you know, with labour rights, women's rights, civil rights, gay rights, and with the climate crisis, yeah. which of course is a violation of everybody's rights, not least our children's. So this is the wake up call for progressive people is don't be analytically stupid, right? The climate crisis is massive. It's objectively sy systemic in the sense that you're going to have to change the whole economy, mm. right? That's not, that's not a postmodernist proposition. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's similar to your children are burning on the top floor of your house. 
there is only one thing to do. You have to break the door down and run upstairs and, and rescue them. That's an objective situation. And this is the core problem is with postmodernist politics, as I call it, is this, this idea that the, the world out there is infinitely malleable. You know, we, we, issues exist to the extent that they're promoted. No, the climate crisis exists, whether you deal with it or not. You know, it's an objective reality. It's death. It's cancer. You know, it's your children's illness. These aren't things you mess about with. You have to actually think about what your responsibilities are. And we've got a long tradition of that. And we've had 30 years, haven't we? I mean, I'm 55. All my adult life, Western societies have had a few little knocks, but they've basically been trending along yep. in terms of the longer history of humanity. But what we're going to be entering into in the next 10 years is the biggest shit show, you know, for the last thousand years, because we're hitting absolute limits. I'll just give you a little example, if you don't mind. Like with the Insulate Britain project that I've been supporting. Yeah, I was going to come on to that, yeah. yes. You know, you think, I don't, you know, I'm like you probably, you know, I don't, initially I didn't know that much about insulation and construction. Now I'm a farmer, I know a lot about food. And then I helped facilitate these meetings with the construction professionals. Now these are the people on the front line, right? And they know what needs to be done. So it turns out that in order to insulate all the houses in Britain, which everyone knows has to happen, you know, it's 20% of carbon emissions, it's going to cost £600 billion, pounds, right? And it's going to require three to 400,000 people. And, and we've got the government going, you know, go away, insulate Britain, we're, we're investing £1.5 this year. Now, what we have to understand is that's a, a complete crisis of delusion mm. in the political class. And that's just construction. Then you've got to look at changing the energy system, right? Then you've got to look at recreating all the infrastructure when temperatures go over 40 degrees. You, you see, the, this is an absolutely terrifying prospect for everybody, regardless of their politics. Yeah. And in science, it's what you call a paradigm shift. Yeah. Um, because you can be working to, you know, a certain understanding, a certain base of rules, and then you see more and more uh, bits of data starting to indicate that it's wrong or that it's yeah. not complete. And what you have to do is have a, a very different model in order to actually progress. And when you get those situations, you have some people who've been working off this model for a long, long time. Yeah. It's very, very hard to, to break that, reject it, and shift across. And what we've got, I think, in, in our political system at the moment is we've got a system that works if there were no climate crisis. Yeah. And so it has been developed on the presumption um, uh, that, there, that there is none. Um, but now we find out that there is. And so that means that the, the car we're driving is not fit for purpose going forward, and we need another vehicle. And so you've got this massive, um, you know, set of interests in keeping the car going as it is. Um, you've got the whole pain of like, doing any, you know, shift, physical or otherwise, of getting from one system to another. And we're at that point where there's there's some awareness of it, but the actual energy required in order to to make the change is huge. Um, and so from what I understand, what Extinction Rebellion are doing is saying, well, instead of having the crisis several years down the line, we need to start that crisis happening now um, while we've proactively. got... Proactively. Yeah, proactively, you know, yeah. uh, start putting up the brick walls now to say you shall go no further um, without major, you know, problems happening on a societal level because that is the only way... To, to get in front of the car and veer it off course. Yeah, and, you know, you put your finger on it. I, I assume you know the book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Is that what it's called? You know, it's a seminal text in the 1960s. I don't know it, actually. And, I'll look and, it up. And that's like the sociology of science. And what the sociology of science was saying is there was this naive idea that science progresses through rational discussion. Scientists get together and they look at the facts and they decide something. But the actual sociology of science through this seminal text actually produced the evidence 
that scientists are just like other human beings. If they are challenged on their own theory, they have this ego, they have this denial mechanism, and they don't Defensive change. Reactions. And yeah. They have a defense, and everyone's got it, right? It's, a, it's deep human nature. And, and so th this naive enlightenment notion that people sit down and rationally decide what is right and wrong is it's there, but it's not the major thing in, in human yeah. societies. It, it's, it's and so you today, get, that's but... why you get this revolution, yep. right? When, when we talk about revolutions, it's not like I'm being unpleasant. It's like solid social science. When you get a, 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 a social system that is under an enormous pressure because it's living a massive lie, whether it's, you know, Newtonian physics or whether yep. it's the climate crisis, you get this sudden shift yep. very quickly. A, a revolution is, is no more than a rapid evolution. When, yeah. when you hit a circumstance where you actually need to evolve very, very quickly yeah. in order to keep going. But the key, the, key the key difference with the climate crisis is there's an objective cutoff point. Yes. Right? That's what makes it metaphysically different to any other crisis in human history. You know, because with most crises, let's take, take Russia. You know, the sociology of the Russian Revolution is those, those pressures were building up in Russian society. And sooner or later, there was going to be a revolutionary episode. Now, it could have been in 1905. It could have been yeah, in 1917. But the, the timing but, was all according to its internal dynamics yes, rather and there was than no, an external the, pressure. It wasn't like yeah. Russia was going to fall off a cliff in, two, in 1920. It was going to happen. Now, what's happening with world society at the moment is it is going to fall off that cliff, which makes it absolutely strategically and morally imperative that we engage in high-level civil disruption. Right. Because that's the only thing that's going to put us in the ballpark of stopping the situation in time. Right. That's so, the analogy. So let, let's talk about that, that disruption then. Because like we, we've laid out all the groundwork as to what are the models of change that work, why this is a particularly different one from, from what we've seen before. That's all, that's all sort of like established uh, now in, in, in this conversation. So then the, the, the crux point now, and this is where you hit um, up against some of the journalists that, that interview you is the actions you're taking now, are they working or not? And is it important to get people on board or not? Who's coming on board and who's, who's reacting to you? So the example that I told you about before we started rolling here was it's just come out today, um, the Insulate Britain uh, roadblocks, a video from that of a, a woman in a car, absolutely distressed, um, uh, mother critically ill in hospital, and she's being blocked by by these these protesters, these activists that are just almost like dumbly standing in front of the car, almost like they don't know what to do. They're kind of like, uh, and of course the responses to that video on Twitter today um, are like. Um, I'd run them over if that was happening to to, to my mum. It's kind of like, can't they just let her through? Just her, like her circumstances are unique. And so lots of people, you know, are focusing on the distress of that person, on how the protesters are handling the situation. And also it then asks the question of, well, talking about, you know, Gandhi or Martin Luther King and things like that, they engaged in this, this charm offensive that they may be doing disruption, but they were working damn hard that, to ensure that there was all this empathy and sympathy for what they were doing, um, even though it was, they were disrupting like the few rather than the many, whereas some people are thinking that some of these actions feel like they're actions against the broader public as a whole, and so they're starting to really piss off the many, not just those that should have the focus most put on them. So, I mean, you are well, not directly associated with, with Extinction Rebellion or Insulate Britain, but what is well, your, Roger I, Hallam, I, I, take I, on I, what are the best methods in this space? How important is it yeah. to get the wider public on side? What we have to understand in terms of how political change works, progressive political change works, is a group in society is subject to injustice, and the rest of society doesn't want to hear it. They don't want to deal with it. Yep. And there's always a progression. So you have to see this over a period of time. You can't just look at today, or even next week, or even next year, right? 
and there's a confusion. And the confusion is people look at the time at which the disruption is happening and say, the public's against you, mm -hmm. which is true. But what's also true is over time, the public comes on side. And the reason for that is the disruption itself. In other words, the disruption creates two things. It creates a polarization. People are against you. Why are you blocking the roads? You're blocking people. But over the longer term, they go, that was justified because of the objective injustice that those people were highlighting through the disruption. So, for instance, like Martin Luther King was the most unpopular man in America in 1961, right? He was a communist. He was, you know, polluting the minds of the young. He was bringing the whole... Well, whole of Birmingham to well, a halt. about the communism thing, that was a label that the FBI put on exactly. him. And exactly. And he got very exacerbated about. Yeah. Yes. So it was very difficult. And the guy, you know, was very stressed, to put it mildly, about it. Yep. But the point is, is through persisting, through persisting in the disruption, there's a breakthrough point. And that breakthrough point, point becomes comes very fast, mm. right? It's a nonlinear thing, like this revolutionary idea. Right. So by 1968, he's a saint. Right. So what happened? What happened during those those seven years was there's a, a change in the moral consciousness of the American public from we don't want to hear about this racism to yes, we accept that racism is fundamentally wrong. Right. Mm. Now, no one's pretending that that sorted out the problem, as we all know. But it's important to be nuanced about it. It was a structural change at the time. Now, yeah, and it's been recognized as now, such, the success what, of the civil what we have movement. to yeah. understand here is there's issues and issues. We can be postmodernist about it. Lots of people say to me, Roger, you know, if you're going to promote an issue, you have to do X, Y, and Z. And what I say to them is, depends on the issue. Mm. Is the issue objectively moral or is it not? Right? Mm. Uh, th okay. th let me just finish on this because sure. this is important. The reason why. Extinction Rebellion is going to win in the long term and insulate Britain these is because we're objectively right in the sense that it's objectively right to be against rape. It's objectively right to be against child abuse. It's objectively right not to send the next generation to hell. There's no doubt about that, right? There's no culture in the world that sends its children to hell. But that's what this society is doing. And that's what, what you should focus on is the 30% of the British public that supports us sitting in the road yep. don't you think that's interesting because if we were just sitting in the road because you know we wanted you know a little bit more money for ourselves something objectively selfish 99 percent of the british public would be going get them off the road throw them in prison the fact that there's 30 percent of the british public going fair enough why are they going fair enough because they've made that transition to understand we're dealing with an objective moral catastrophe in this country. Yeah, you, see, so, you see how that works? Yeah, I, I get all of that. And kind of like you're in good company here because, you know, I, I get the purpose of all of that. Um, to bring it back to that, that woman, though, because this is going to get focused on by your opponents. So it is smart to think about how you deal with it. It just occurs to me that if there were a policy of, you know, where there is distress, helping someone like that through just shows that little bit of human kindness that, that, that kind of like makes these people who are blocking roads also like heroes, kind of like, we understand stress, we're on the, we're on the same human level as you. All these guys, sorry, you're going to have to take it. But her, you know, you know that situation. And I, and I don't think they've, they've prepped themselves for that, but, but this is the thing that those that, that oppose your cause are going to focus on again and again and again. And they're going to say, look, they're less human. They're, they're standing around dumbly. You can like, imagine if they were doing that to my mother. And if you just alleviate just that little bit and just do, do little things of, 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 of kindness, think about how you can integrate that, that can massively diffuse that. Because for the most part, lots more people are happy to for, for roads to be blocked for things to be shut down hardy hardy ha um i'm on board with that it looks fun it looks like something needs to be jumped up as long as it doesn't do this and as long as it doesn't do that so as if you can release some of those pressure valves just just carefully 
then you prevent that that narrative because people are happy to see the disruption so long as it's it's not you know killing people or things like that see for example if, if someone were to die in an ambulance on the way to hospital then that would undermine everything that you're doing sure you you know it'll get in the press but it would set you back time wise and that's critical time so it's like the terrorism thing right <laughs> like poor, poor analogy but but you, there but there are points there's, at there's, which there's no question that you can go too far right yes everyone agrees that okay the question Good. is how far do you go yes um totally. my analysis for what it's worth is you have to go pretty far you have to go a lot further than what is conventionally considered like appropriate comfortable okay okay now you know it's an inexact science but yeah. a lot of people would have said before insulate britain and lots of people did say before insulate britain you don't want to block motorways everyone's going to be against you it's going to backfire now that's what's said to every non-violence campaign in history before it happens mm. okay the point is is you have to stick to it right this is a two-year process it's not like this morning or next week it's a strategic process of continual disruption you have to keep at it and it's that process of putting you out yourself out into the public sphere which which finally gets people to understand this objective moral crisis okay? sure so, i get that but to to ask and i don't know how well you know this you know all of the the, the tactics of insulate britain do do they have for example written down a code of how they handle different situations do they have that level of organization whereby they say whereby they anticipate different um uh instances there's there's protocols it's an organized okay, so they do have campaign. protocols okay. so for instance like the police are informed and they're supposed to legally prevent the traffic from going over 20 miles an hour for instance right, right? so but what, so what in the case of this woman because you know that it that actually does bother me a bit because when i see footage like that i think have they is this a deliberate resistance to let her through in order to up the ante and get the news or um do they just not have a plan or a protocol for this incident because it does look like they're standing around dumbly not knowing what to do hmm. and so for me, I just want to know from you, I mean, what what would you do in this situation if it was not an Insulate Britain protest, but a Roger Hallam protest in that circumstance? What would you do? I'd stay there. You would? Yeah. And if it were an ambulance and there was someone that could potentially die in there, would you stay there? Yeah. So you would be prepared for someone to die in an ambulance well, being I wouldn't, blocked I wouldn't, by you personally. I wouldn't construct it like that, right? In no, all but, social, but if, but if in you... all, in all, let me just finish, right? Because you've said your little framing, which makes me look like some devil, right? This is this is the framing that that I I promote, okay. right? Which is we have a government that's systematically facilitating the destruction of this country, right? Objectively, that's the situation. We have three for four years in order to make this change. For sure. We're looking at the death of billions of people, potentially, in the global south, who are entirely innocent, right? So it's a means and ends process. All civil resistance episodes, in actuality, including Martin Luther King and Gandhi and all these people we think were heroes, and the suffragettes, involved innocent people being hurt, right? Civil resistance is not purist, you know, elite university ethics course discussion stuff people get hurt in political disruption sure. when when but workers let me just say accident when right. when workers go on strike right there's often damage and and distress caused by that and sometimes deaths right yep now what I, what we have to what we have to understand here yeah. is this is how democracy works democracy works through social conflict but that social conflict is always limited and that's how we avoid civil wars. That's how we avoid major social disruption. And what civil resistance is saying is, is those people have an absolute lie, right? 
And that absolute line is that they will be entirely non-violent, verbally and physically, either to the public or to the police. That's the ethical line. When they're sitting in the road, what they're saying is, is the government has had four weeks to make a statement to say, we will enact our primary responsibility under the British Constitution to the British people and start to decarbonise, right? Four weeks. I, I, so they have to take some responsibility for the disruption, right? The police and the highway agency have to take responsibility for the disruption because they refuse to enact the law to slow down the traffic. Do the protesters take any responsibility? Of course, but it's justified. The protesters are justified as in all real life moral situations. Okay, so I, I get the, the philosophical moral setup whereby, you know, the train is coming down the track. There is, um, and it's going to hit six billion people. And you can pull a lever and it goes off and it kills one person said, what would you do? And everyone would say, yeah, pull the lever and kill the one person. But when you've got the option of pulling the lever and not killing that one person, why well, would you stand in front of an ambulance and say, mm, sorry, this, this, this is the this, government's fault, I'm this desperately is, sorry. This is, when you could say, what we're doing here is we're causing social blockage, we need big change, all of you are going to be pissed off, but like we are, we are not prepared to deliberately and knowingly let this, this person in an ambulance here die. That, I mean, that's the block for me. It's like when we were talking before about terrorism, you know, everyone's got their level. I, I support road blockages. I support disruption. I think it needs to be bothering people mm. on a daily basis. But you were saying yourself, you know, that makes me look like a demon. Well, then don't demonize yourself because, I mean, I don't think that that extra bit of, of blocking an ambulance with someone dying in it actually helps. I think it sets you back. Yeah. That, that would be my take yeah. on it. Well, we agree to disagree then, don't we? <laughs> you know, like it's a, it's yeah. a, I mean, it's a rabbit hole that the, the media wants to run around. I mean, we've been, what, talking for half an hour and you spent like 10 minutes on one person, right? Yes, this but, is, but, this but the is, point is, is, it's, it, but the point is, it's because other people are going to. And you might actually come up to that sure, situation sure. in the future. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? This is what the media does. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, that's prophecy. what they're looking out for. Sure. And that and might this, happen this at is, some point. And this is what, this is and what the battle is. And then it's going to be a big discussion mm. that sits to the side of what you want. You want the discussion on the, this, the, but if that happens, the discussion, it's going to here. Look, it, it, it's a rabbit hole, right? Yeah. It's like, a, it's like a witch hunt. Whatever you say, you're fucked, right? It's like, this is how the media works. They, they pick out a little, a little instance, right? It's a tragic instance, but it's a small instance. And they just milk it for all, for yeah, all it's worth. Yeah, and they will. Right? And so then why are you going to give that to them? Because we have to make clear that we're determined. Right? right. That's that's the long-term so, message. Okay, so this is interesting because then that would indicate to me that if this incident did happen, you would think that it's actually, and, and bear in mind my provocative phrasing here, <laughs> a good thing because then it would elevate the issue to absolute national discussion, national catastrophe-like discussion for, for a good uh, week nonstop. It would dominate the media on, on that, that massive philosophical moral question about what you had done. And that would be extremely disruptive on the whole philosophical issue. Well, <laughs> I think you've argued yourself into the opposite position, which, okay. is, which is, yes... You know, if someone died, it would be a massive matter of public debate. Yes. And massive public debates is what changes public consciousness. So if that were to happen, then it would be a does, huge does, boost does, for the cause of extinction. It may be. Rebellion it may be. But like if you're going to be honest with yourself, historically, if you're going to be honest, mm -hmm. right, tragedies where people die do create political change. They do. Yes. So, you know, if you want to play the sort of moral analysis card, you need to see the other side of the argument. Now, I'm not, in general terms, obviously there's a balance, right? And we, we're, it's not like you're totally opposed to me and it's not like no, I'm not totally at opposed all. to us. Yeah. You know, but it's a matter. These, but these are scenarios that I think that we need to talk through because it, in, in the abstract concept, you know, it, it's fascinating about how this would then knock onto the news and, and then, you know, 
cause more discussion and maybe accelerate progress or maybe decelerate progress. And, and it's hard to know. So that, that well, it's not so hard to know. So well. what I would argue is, as long as you're engaged in open civil disobedience, in other words, as long as you're still going on GB News, mm -hmm. as long as you're still there in the public realm, ready to take criticism, ready to enter into open debate, then yep. you will win eventually, right? Despite and because of the tragedies, right? Both, mm. right? Let's be sophisticated about it, right? You know, if we look historically, let's take the example of the woman who run in, ran in front of the horse, right? Mm -hmm. And died in the mm -hmm. suffragettes. Everyone, you know, maybe half the people listening to this know about it. Why did they know about it? Because someone died, right? And you might say, well, no, that's okay for someone to die. Let's think about it a little bit more clearly. You're running into a horse. What about all the horses coming behind? What about those riders? What about their families? What about all the people who are going to be traumatized watching it? You see, it's not, com it's not simple. Political change is not simple. It's, it's a rough and ready business. And, and there's moral dilemmas in it. But don't pretend that it's all on one side of the equation. Not at all obvious, right, that we should let that person through. Yeah, there's a case. And, you know, I'm not 100% I'm not dogmatic. I don't know the micro situation around it. Mm. Like, why not, you know? And, and it's a bit of me thinks. But the fundamental point is, is you have to push keep pushing and transgressing social norms and doing mass civil disobedience in order to get that to that moment of reckoning. And along the way, there will be people that get hurt, people in, involved and other people. And if we're going to, you know, this is a serious program, so let's not, you know, turn it into a tabloid headline. It's, it's a problem. And what I'm saying is in a democratic society, at least you keep that problem within limits. Yeah, you know, because you don't have terrorism. Why do you not have terrorism? Because there's an outlet for social disruption, and there's an honourable tradition of it. But it's not, it's not, it's not pleasant. You know, it's not. It is messy. Um, you know, you might idealise Martin Luther King. If you look at the nitty gritty, as it were, the nuts and bolts of his campaigns, they went to places where they knew people would get hurt, not just the demonstrators. But bystanders, right? They made that so they decision went because the end provoke. justified the means. Yeah, within that limit, within the limit of a civil disobedience, non-violence protocol. Yep. You so see what I mean? Were they were clear. Provoke, they uh, were like prepared. Violence and, they were and prepared deaths. for bystanders to get hurt. Yeah. That's part of the deal. But they were not prepared to cross that line into violence, proactive violence themselves. That's the ethical principle here. So that boundary is is um. That's the boundary that you draw. You don't engage in proactive violence, but you do engage in activities that hold firm to a principle and fully aware that this may cause uh, not just distress and damage, but also you know, injury and death. Um, well, there's always a small possibility of injury and yep. death. You know, when the tube drivers go on strike, right? Yep. You no, know, you might not like that, and or you might like it. But when people go on strike, there's often a possibility of health and safety like protocols not being followed. Right. But what the workers are saying is, our cause is justified that small possibility of yeah. tragedy. And if you think that's absolutely wrong, then you're not in the real world because doctors make that decision, right? Health services make the decision. You make that so decision. For example, if nurses and doctors go on strike, they're fully aware that. Yeah, and okay. then there's a valid democratic debate around it, right? In terms of the nuances. Yep. But let's not pretend there's not another side to the argument. Yeah, <laughs> sure. So no, but this this is interesting. This is mm. like fascinating because um, it it draws out um, so much about the the situation we're in and what needs to be done to get change and how far different people are prepared to go on that. So there's going to be a whole spectrum of how much and how far different people are prepared to push with, with, with different initiatives. Um, this podcast is um, acknowledges that, you know, the planet is fucked up and the system is fucked up and, and looks to... Can I just say, right, that's the wrong framing, right? Okay. We've had 30 years of the planet is fucked up. That's classic sort of, you know, separation psychology. It's mm -hmm. like there's a planet there 
And it's a little bit unfortunate that it's going to go down the drain. No, what we're talking about is the loss of people's pensions in the next 10 years, mm -hmm. the loss of people's incomes, the mass migration of hundreds of millions of people, the indescribable injustice to people of color in the global south because of the collective selfishness of people in the north. Right? Sure. We're talking about the biggest crime in human history imposed by the rich against the global poor. When we frame it like that, it becomes part of our mainstream political radical tradition, which is over our dead bodies, do we allow evil to happen? Social political evil. When one group proactively designs the death of another group. You see, that's the new framing in the 2020s. Dolphins and whales and, you know, rivers and all this. That's all fine. Those days have gone, though. What we're looking at now is three to four years before we enact the greatest crime in human history against the poor people on this planet and the next thousand generations. Right? Okay. That, that but, sounds a little bit more like puts you in the gut, doesn't it? Yeah, but I've got to fit it in, in like a short title. But, but yes, I mean, yeah. essentially... Well, let's, but, let's, but we'll let's just say what from, it is. It's yeah. not about saving the planet, right? Okay. It's preventing the genocide of billions of people. Yeah. That's but what it is. But... But it, it, the, the podcast being about we are in a critical situation, um, not just on the level of the planet, but in terms of human society. Like the last one we did was on disinformation and rampant disinformation, mm. which means that it's very, very difficult to tackle a whole load of issues when you've got so many bad actors so powerful through social media. So it's acknowledging that currently we in humanity are not on the right course for the future. We are in a mess. We do need a paradigm shift to a much better place and we're looking for what are the key things that that absolutely need to happen now if you had the power if you were in a position of power how do we unfuck as quickly as possible the current situation so as far as the climate crisis coming up and its impact on humans and and human society around the globe bearing in mind that you know the power structures associated with it what are the key things that if you were prime minister um, and you had the full support of your, your cabinet, right? What are the three things that you would start doing urgently over the next few days or, or, or week? If it, if it were you in that okay, position. Okay, so that's like one of these sort of Oxbridge questions, you know. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're dealing, what, what, we're dealing what we, with... The, what we yeah. need to understand, you're a scientist, you, hopefully you understand it, like, Social reality is, is a complex system, okay? There's loads of moving parts. Yep. And it's not mechanical. It's not like, hey, make Roger prime minister, and then I do A, B, and C, like you're starting a car engine, right? That's not how we need to construct a strategy of political change. Mm -hmm. We have to probe what's called probe the system. We have to develop the system, get feedback from the system, and then re-enact re with, the, with the system. Mm -hmm. So there's no binary. It's not like, hey, we're all powerless, and then suddenly Roger's prime minister and he can do what he wants. Like That's like, you know, that's 12-year-old social science. What we, ha what we have to do is think, okay, how do we create enough social disruption in order to create a change in the political system that will facilitate the empowerment of greater social disruption that will create even more change in the political system? So there's a sort of dialectic between so those two processes. So that seems very slow and evolutionary. No, whereas... not necessarily. It can happen in about three weeks. Okay? The, 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 what but the... how do you get to the solutions? What the, the, okay, the solutions let, let, that you're we you're need gonna to You're going to have to give me like so, three minutes. So there's... <laughs> but, but to come to the main targets, there is, for example, insulate Britain. Yeah, well, let, right. Let, that's that's uh, a, that's a clear thing that can be done, which is going to reduce CO two emissions, um, and which is going to then, you know, build those gains into the system. You know, that is a, right. that is a clear I, I can, objective. If you give me yeah. two or three minutes, I'll lay it sure. out. It's it's a little bit complicated, right? It's not like Roger becomes prime minister and I do X, Y, and Z. I mean, that's just fairy tale stuff. Okay. This the the process of political change, a viable process of political change, is as follows, right? That Three or four thousand people going to London, right? There's mm -hmm. over three thousand arrests. The top judiciary have told Extinction Rebellion, and it's well known that if there's three or four thousand arrests, the system will start to crack. In the same way as the system starts to crack with the Black Lives Matter protests in the States, when there's about ten thousand arrests, then the system starts to crack emotionally, politically, materially. 
in order as people start going, okay, so what legislative change do you want? You know, in the French, the French rebellion of 2018, you know, when they're all blocking the roads, mm. there was 100,000 people on roads. By Christmas, the French state retreated, right, because the police were threatening not to go out in January. Political change exists. It changes very quickly, and it's nonlinear. It's like nothing's happening. It's like a labor strike, you know. Nothing's happening, and then suddenly one day, the bosses go, okay, call them into the room, we're going to do a deal, okay? So that's the first thing to understand, is there's a tipping point. Now, when that tipping point happens, that's just opening up a fluidity in the political space. Mm. It's just foundational. It's not, it doesn't mean you're going to win anything. It just means that people are suddenly going, okay, let's talk, right? Just like a labor negotiation. That's step one. Step two is there needs to be a way of involving in a popular democratic way the whole population because what's required is a fundamental shift. So it's not a top-down approach. It's not like someone can say, right, we're going to, you know, sort out insulation. Loads of people are going to disagree with it. You have to have what's called a, a democratic legitimation process, which is popular. The political class cannot do it because everyone hates them, right, for all the reasons we know. So that's where a citizens' assembly comes in. It's a fundamentally new, innovative, like, political methodology, mm -hmm. where you get a selection of people randomly, you know, bus drivers from Manchester, you know, caterers from Basingstoke, that sort of thing, yep. in the room. And they discuss it. And they come out of the room like they have done in, in France, saying, OK, we're going to have to stop flights. OK, we're going to have to l eat less meat. OK, we're going to have to insulate all the houses. OK, we're going to have to have total renewable energy. Everyone knows broadly what needs to be done in order to decarbonize, right? Right. And then that's presented to the political class. And then two things happen. Either the political class goes, fair enough, or if they're still being dominated by the special interest, they'll say no. Then the people come back onto the street, right? Right. It, 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 there's two or three iterations here, mm -hmm. right? Because we're dealing with an enormous juggernaut of private interests. Yep. Okay, so that, that's given me the answer that I want because... Yep. So you don't need me to be prime minister, by the way, right? No, good. It's yeah. a structural. <laughs> but, it's a structural design. But, but yeah, so I I ask, you know, like what we need to do to kind of like unfuck the situation. And I was thinking um, that you would give me answers to do with um, climate change itself. But actually, what you've given me answers to is how you break the current system and set up a better system. So your solutions are firstly ensure that there are so many arrests that the system is it's breaking synergistic, on you. right? Let's yeah. not be sequential about it. It's the synergistic okay. fusion of three systems. Number one, social disruption. Social disruption on its own is inadequate, but it's necessary, yeah. right, as we've discussed. So number you've got two, a breaking of the system number two and you've got your citizens' assemblies. Political legitimation. Yeah, you that, need that to have, have a national conversation. With think the wider think public. about Churchill in 1940, right? All through the 1930s, people quite rightly were in denial about Hitler. You know, no one wanted a war. They just had the First World War. No one wants massive change. Yep. But what, Hitler, what, what Churchill said to the nation is, tough, right? We've got this guy. He's a monster. We're going to have to go for war. It's a matter of duty, honor, and all the rest of it. And in, in, in a matter of months, the whole nation went, okay, that's the reality. Yep. That's the process we need on the climate. So that was the, the paradigm shift then. That's the par it's, right. it's the, let's concretize it. What it means is, is the willingness to sacrifice your material interest for your children. That's the frame. Okay. And when it's framed like that, then obviously everyone agrees. But it needs to be framed by ordinary people to ordinary people through that citizen assembly. Got it. And then the third element, of course, is doing the right engineering jobs, right? That's a technical thing. I'm not an expert on it. Go, there's plenty of experts. They'll tell you how to decarbonize this and all the rest of it. And obviously they need to do a good job. Okay. So, no, that's another discussion. No, no, that, I mean, that's, we'll wrap it up on that because mm. that's given me the answer that I want, which is kind of like the way to go about this now is one, to ensure that you've got that paradigm shift where people are prepared to make material loss for the better future. You need enough people to be um, disrupting the current system, whether it be through their own arrests or whatever, and you need the establishment of legitimate bodies in citizens' assemblies that tell the political class what to do so that the solutions start from the citizens and then from that will flow mm. the demand for the technology 
to start fixing yeah. the system. And that's the good news, isn't it? Right. Okay. The good news out of this interview is it's entirely possible. It's entirely possible. It's very difficult, but it's entirely possible to have a progressive democratic transition at this moment in time in 2021. Yep. But every year that goes by, the probability of dysfunctional transitions goes up exponentially, right? Yep. Eco-fascism, social collapse, you know, Trump. We know what the alternative is, yep. right? The alternative is hell, right? So, so it's it couldn't all about be more important. That, that rapid yeah. uh, social political shift in order to turn the system right round so that it's better set yeah. up in order to deal with these problems. And, and just to finish off, for your audience, <laughs> this is about individual responsibility. You know, you can go on to Re Extinction Rebellion website and you can jo join in the civil disobedience. You can go in Insulate Britain website, join in the civil disobedience. Like this, so this time is not going to come again. Okay, got it. <laughs> Roger, thanks ever so much. Yeah, well, for, thank you very for, much. For an, for an hour of your time, that was fascinating. Uh, thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, I hope you really enjoyed that show. If you did, of course, share, like, subscribe, and also comment about what you thought and what you would like to see next.